Good morning. Ha, ah, got you awake anyways, right? It is good to hear you and see you and smile and we celebrate Palm Sunday and Easter next week because if there wasn't an Easter, if there wasn't a resurrection, what, what would we, there's nothing, right? This is nothing. We are, there, there's no hope, there's no life, there's no nothing. This is, this is why we do what we do and this is why we believe because of what Jesus Christ did and what he's going to do. And we just praise his name, right? Amen. 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 I, uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they talked about in the Old Testament when the, the tribes of Israel would set up their tents, the temple uh, tabernacle would be right in the center and where the sacrificing would be. So that was the center of their whole life, right? They saw it, they, the smell of it, the, the, the look of it, the, the, just everything. They saw every day the, the, the sacrifice that was needed every day. And we come to church and we clean things up and we put pretty hearts on the wall that Jesus loves us, right? Where we forget about the sacrifice so often that Jesus paid for you and I. The struggle, the sacrifice, the death. And that's why Jesus called us to, to die to ourselves. Which we'll talk a little bit more today, but more next week. So that we can become what God wants us to be. Transformed in him. But today, we're going to talk about politics, because everybody loves politics, right? Ha <laughs> ha, laughter. Yeah, you're funny, Bob, right? Politics is the act... No, I am a little bit, but you'll, you'll catch on here in a minute, okay? Politics is the activities associated with governance of a country or an area, especially the debate or conflict among individuals or parties, having or hoping to achieve power. Right? And it's amazing to see the lengths to which people in today's world uh, will go to be elected or hold a position that they already have. Uh, it's, it's almost like anything goes anymore. And it's probably uh, no different than the past, but uh, we're living in the now, right? We see the now. Uh, Barack Obama said these words a few years back. He says, now even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us, the spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them today, there's not a liberal America or conservative America, there's United States of America. There's not a black America, white America, Latino America, Asian America. There's the United States of America. And we got to remember that we are, uh, uh, as a church, we are of a different kingdom now, we may be citizens of the United States, but we are ultimately citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we must not let anything divide us in, in, what, in God's truths, right? We stand on his truth, and, and we are one, male, female, everywhere across the nation, uh, across the world, we are one, his church, those that believe in, in Jesus Christ. And... Uh, uh, Let's go back to the campaign, campaign trail if you're, if you're running for president, right? Um, anything goes to destroy your opposition. We, we see that not only today, but we've seen it through history and mankind. We see politicians who become chameleons. Of course, we, we're chameleons too often. But politicians that become uh, chameleons to fit into their surroundings and to be like everyone else or what everybody else wants. Uh, we see that people are destroyed by things they've said um, even maybe years ago. We see lies are said and then, and then believed before reality checks. We see where people are guilty before they're innocent instead of innocent uh, before proven guilty. And it was no different in the days of Jesus. That the religious leaders there did whatever they could to get rid of Jesus because he got in their way. He got in their way of pride and got their way of power, got in their way of position. They got to where they, uh, you know, this is, this is mine and I'm going to keep it at no matter cost. And we see that in the spiritual battle of God uh, versus Satan. God's won the war, God's bigger, we know that, but there's still a battle going on. A battle for souls, a battle for you, a battle for your family and children, a battle for, for every human being that is going on. 
And we need to understand and be reminded of that. There is a battle happening, bigger than, bigger than we know, bigger than we can see, but it's happening. In Matthew 26, 59 through 31, it says, The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus. Okay? They were people in power, the religious leaders. They did not want Jesus around. They were looking for false evidence so they could even put him to death, to get rid of him even unto death. Get him out of here. But I love this. But they could not find any. Next verse. They couldn't find any. Great. So they just ignored it and went on with life. There's nothing we can do, right? No. You're right. Uh, well, if we're, if we're not going to find something, you know, something false against him we can use, we'll make it up. They did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. And finally, two came forward and said, this fellow, this fellow Jesus, said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Now we know, uh, we understand that that was talking about his body, the temple, would, would be crucified, would die, be put in a grave for three days and, and uh, being brought back to life because death could not hold him, right? But they didn't understand that, and they thought it was blasphemy. They thought it was whatever, an, an excuse to put him to death. But it was an all-out attack uh, uh, to keep power, to keep pride, keep, keep position, Things that Jesus had, right? He had the power. He had the position. He had perfect pride. You know, there's good pride and bad pride, but he was God. He knew who he was. That was his identity was he was God. And, but what did he do with that? And as Christ followers, uh, we must do the same. And as I read this, think about in your life, have I given this up? In Philippians, the letter to uh, Philippi from the Apostle Paul, he writes, you, these are to Christians, to Christ followers, to those who say they have put their faith in Jesus Christ, says you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Okay, and most of us say, you know, might say, yeah, I got that attitude until something happens, right? And we lose that attitude really quickly. You must have the same attitude Christ had, though he was God. He did not think equality with God was something to hang on to, something to, to, to clean on to, right? Instead, he gave up all his divine privileges. He took a humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. See, the incarnation is really incredible, something beyond our imagination, that, that God could be fully God and be fully human at the same time. But we see how, how was the conception, right? He was born through the Virgin Mary, humanness, but he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. So the two became one in this, this beautiful, uh, beautiful thing uh, that God was fully human. Because many times, you know, in my life, I think, you know, oh, Jesus was God. So, you know, he couldn't sin. No, he was fully human too, and it's hard for us to understand that. That he felt everything you felt. He had the same desires. He had the same temptations, yet he never sinned. Because of the perfectness of of God and man coming together. And in his his humanness, in 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 this divine, beautiful thing, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus gave up his rights that he had as God. I'm not going to hang on to that. I'm giving that up. And it says in verse 8 that Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. I mean, this was God. He humbled himself to death for you. Don't ever lose that. For you. He loves you so much. He died for you. So verse 9, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth under and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
that one day everyone will bow to him and confess that he is Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings, whether they've accepted him and have faith in him or not. I pray that you trust in him. So Jesus gave up his rights. Do we give up our, our rights as a Christian? Are we willing to do that so that we may be obedient to the Father? It's part of that dying to self and living in the newness of what God created you to be. How do we, how do we die to self? That is, that is giving up our desires for God's. If, if God tells you to, okay, there, there's a lot of good, and you can do a lot of good, but if God says, no, I want you to do this, then you give up what you, have, uh, what you desire, what you want, your rights, per se, right, for his. Exactly what Jesus did. And, and some of that's not black and white. You know, it's real tough sometimes in situations. Lord, what do you want me to do? And that's part of growing and dying to self is saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And not, I'm just going to go do this. I'm going to do my own thing. It's giving up uh, the right to, to say the, sometimes the truth and, and, and let, letting the Lord speak through that. And he humbled himself to obedience, which may be the, one of the another most awesome things that, that Jesus did, is just humbled himself to obe- obedience to the Father. It says in Hebrews, I believe, that he learned obedience to the Father. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he said, not my will, but yours, Father. As he did what the Father wanted to. So let's go back to the process of uh, becoming a presidential candidate. Okay, so you want to be a presidential candidate, right? Well, you gotta you gotta win some primaries. You gotta win some caucuses. You gotta fly all over the place. You gotta speak to a lot of a lot of people. You gotta kiss babies, shake people's hands, and say, "I am the one for you," right? And you get enough support, somebody to come behind you and say, "Yeah, you you are the man. You are the woman. Let's do it." So you get up there, and there might be, you know, 60,000 people on the debate platform. How many were there last time? There was like, there was like they had two, two d- debates, didn't they? They had like 14 on one night, 14 on the next, and it was like, like a, uh, one of these shows on TV where they knocked each other. Survivor. Yeah, that's what it was. Survivor. So you survive all this, right? Survive the debates, figuring out what to say that will make your base get, get really happy and, and some of those other people you need votes for too. You know, you, you got to think about what you're going to say that can't be used against you in the future. Uh, all these things. You got to raise money because it's all about the money. Um, and survive, surviving the onslaught of people trying to destroy you. Trying to say you're no good, he ain't gonna, he's no good for you, whatever. And then... And then if you get nominated, then you've got to pick a, a vice president, or a vice president uh, candidate to run with you, right? And it's usually somebody that you've been putting down for the last year, <laughs> right? I mean, isn't that how it works? You know, you were a jerk nine months ago, but now can you be my, you know, second in command? Don't agree with anything you like. It's politics, Right? The whole process. And then, and then you come to this huge convention. Right? They all, every side gets together. They come together in the hopes they found the right leader for the next, in America, the next four years or the eight years in America. You know, our hope is in that, in that, in that person for at least a few years. And as we look at Jesus, as he, as he rode in on that donkey, there was a celebration and there were crowds out there and, and many were there because they had seen J- Jesus raised the dead and they're spreading the word and they're coming out and they're throwing their cloaks down and they're throwing the palm leaves out and Jesus is coming on a donkey, right? Well, what was the expectation? What, what were these people that were surrounded? Think about the people in, in, the, in the story. Put yourself in this story. The celebration of hope. But what might be the people's hope in this story? The Israelites, the Jewish, the people, they may, our king is coming. 
right? Our king is coming. My king or my political party has arrived and he agrees with me and he's going to, you know, he's going to change things. Ever thought that? This, this person, Jesus, he thinks like I do. He's good. He's nice. He, he gives stuff, right? And, it's, and it, 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 my ways will happen and my enemies will be defeated. It's probably what many of them thought. And then you have the religious leaders, those in power, the Sanhedrins and Sadducees. Uh, we go to John 12, 17 through 19. We read these words. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many people went out to meet Jesus because they had heard about the miraculous sign. And the Pharisees said to each other, you know, just put on your Eeyore voice, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone's gone after him, right? Nothing we can do. Gloom, despair, and agony on me, these, these people, right? Their power had been diminished. Their position had been lowered. Uh, their influence had been weakened. Now, the difference between the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees compared to John the Baptist, remember what he said when he saw Jesus? And his disciples asked him, Hey, John, Jesus is, he's, he's baptizing more people than you are, even though it was the disciples doing it, right? And, and, and the, John the Baptist's disciples were getting a little, uh, you know, offended, you know? And, and John says, you know, I must become less, and he must become more, right? It's not about me. John understood that. It was about Jesus. John was just a precursor to, to Jesus, And here we see those religious leaders, though those that should have known better, that knew, knew the Old Testament inside and out, but didn't know how to, how to do it right, right? It was all law. I must become less, but they wanted to be more. What about you? Do you need to become less and less and Jesus more and more in your life? What about the Romans? Man, they're this great big empire in charge of the, the educated world is, is, they knew at that time, and all they saw was a minor skirmish over here that needed to be taken a quick, quickly care of. Okay, we're not going to let anything get in the way of our control. We'll just come in here, we'll take care of it. If the Jewish leaders don't handle it, we will. You know, there's just minor inconvenience. Take care of it quickly and decisively. What about the kingdom of God? What was happening here at the kingdom of God? As Jesus was riding in, you know, can you, can you just see the angels? You know, there wasn't a church yet. Church didn't start to the Acts, right? After the Holy Spirit came down. There really wasn't a church. There were believers. There was those that had faith in God. But here it was, Jesus riding in, and the perfect sacrifice is about to be made for all people. The Jews are thinking, yeah, he's going to set up throne and, and take over. The Romans just, or the, the Sadducees just want to get rid of this guy. And, and the kingdom of God is bringing the sacrifice for all people. And forgiveness would be available for all to repent. And it was just about ready to give birth, right? The church was about to start. The Holy Spirit in the church was about to start. But it had to go to the cross. And not one person saw that coming except God. Jesus was coming to the cross. And we like to make the crosses look pretty, right? But put yourself on that cross, up in the air, people around you, weeping and crying, mocking, just watching. As you're hanging up there, hanging up there just, just trying to breathe. That's what makes it so wonderful for us because Christ did that for you and I. And it's a wonderful cross, but it's also an awful cross that Christ had to bear for you and I. I found this interesting I read it from another pastor, and it was random thoughts on uh, Palm Sunday and out of Mark 11. He said these words, this morning while studying the Palm Sunday story, it struck me 
that among the palm wavers may have been the original Christian nationalists. They saw Jesus as a political figure who would restore their place in the halls of power. But instead of making his way to the Roman seat of government to confront Pilate, Jesus entered the Jews' own temple and started to clean house. And we all know how that weekend, end, that week ended. He went on to say, well, I'm not a Christian nationalist. I wonder in what other areas of my life I may be guilty of the same error. In what ways do I expect Jesus to fix my circumstances instead of being he is more focused on fixing me? In what ways do I still expect Jesus to fix my circumstances than when he is more focused on fixing me? Do we want a God, do we want Jesus that will fix our circumstances or do we want a God that will transform me into what he created me to be? I tell you, God wants the second, right? He wants the second. And he cannot transform you into what he created you to be until you die to yourself. You can get glimpses, you can get bits and pieces, but you can't be new when you're holding on to the old. It's got to die. It's got to be snipped off. It's got to be pruned, whatever. Let God do the pruning, and it hurts. There's been times I say, no, Lord, I don't want to do that. But he always just draws me back, little by little, because God loves us so much. He just little by little takes us pieces at a time and just come on come on bob come on trust me because his ways are always better so some questions are you glad because of the new king or president will fix your circumstances more than jesus changing you and let me ask this question do circumstances control you or do you let jesus change you through those things that's a tough one. Right? Do you let circumstances change you or do you let Jesus change you through the circumstances? Because he wants to change you. We see that after the parade, after the celebration, after uh, the, the palm leaves and the, and the garments there, Jesus went to the temple and he looked around. I just went in and looked around. And then I believe it was the next day, he sees a fig tree that doesn't have figs and he curses it. And later that tree dies. And then we see that he goes back into the temple and he cleans house. He cleans it out and says, get out of here. He says, get out of here. Both, both the temple and the fig tree were not producing fruit. They were not doing what they were intended to do. And Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. God's house will be a house of prayer. And as we look at prayer and what, what it was intended to be, is, is prayer is uh, love God first, right? Prayer is talking to each other and a, a, a difficult, difficult to, to have a relationship with anyone if you don't talk to them. And if you don't talk to God, you can't have a relationship in the same way. So prayer is talking together. It's building that relationship. It's, it's having that humility that he is God and I am not. And we'll get that straight, and that, that, that'll solve a lot of things. But it helps us to communicate in prayer as we listen, as we, as we hear, as we understand, as the Holy Spirit transforms us. And it, prayer gives us reliance on God. And what it had become was commercialized. It had been used for profit. For the people. And it was being used for, God, uh, for the people's purpose and not God's purpose. It was a reliance on self and it was a reliance on I can do whatever and, uh, <laughs> and God won't, won't do anything about it. And while all this is going on, all this stuff for, for power and pride and position... While all this is going on, Jesus is headed to the cross. 
so that all these things that get in our, our way of relationship with him could be forgiven once and for all. Well, everybody else has their own opinion and thinks what's going going to happen and what they need to do for themselves. Jesus is going to die for everyone else so that they and you and I could have true worship and life in Christ. The Bible often talks about Jesus being a stumbling block. I wrote these words. Jesus is a stumbling block, not because people don't understand, but because people do understand and don't want to change. Jesus' way is good and right and keeps people from doing what they want, so they want to get rid of him. In Matthew 6.23, we read these words. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have the mind, have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. In Matthew 6.23, the NLT, it says, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap. You are seeing things merely through a human point of view, not from God's. If you know that story, you know, Jesus said he was going to go die. And Peter said, No way, you're not going to do that. No way, Jesus, you are not going to die. And, and Jesus looked right in front of him and said, get away from me, Satan, right? I don't know if anybody came up and called you Satan, what would you think? <laughs> Slap him, right? Turn the other cheek. I get you both, right? But this is coming from the Lord and Master, Jesus, the Son of God. Get behind me. Because Jesus knew he had to go there. But Peter couldn't see any. He, Peter could not see through his eyes uh, the expectations he had for Jesus if Jesus was going to be dead. And Christ points that out. You are seen merely through a human point of view, not God's. And we'll talk more about that next week. There's so many things we don't understand. Never understand, but we can know more and more as we humble ourselves and, and listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient to Him and die to self. In 1 Corinthians 1 21 23, we read these words Since God saw, and since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom, He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who asks for signs from heaven, and is foolish to the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, us, who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it makes all no sense, right? But for us who believe, for us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we know, right? Surely as this uh, rug is reddish, is that what color that is? I don't know, burgundy, I don't know. Right? We know, we know that Jesus was ridiculed, he was abandoned, he was beat brutally, he kept silent, was obedient. And he's king of kings and lord of lords. And we will bow down to him one day. I look forward to that day when I just say, thank you, Lord. And I can say these words out of Romans 1, 16 through 17 as the team comes up to... Uh, Get ready for communion. Apostle Paul said these words, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news about Jesus tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life.